asking you about himself, I'll tell you about how I met him. The first um, time I went to Latino Professionals Connect was to scout out people that might be interested in Rotary. And one of the first people I met there was Hugo. And he at that time was working at Key Bank on 30th and Hilliard and we started talking and I said, wow, I used to work at that bank when I was the drive up teller um, back in 019 something or other. And uh, he says, well, why don't you come by and, and check out the branch now? And uh, I met the manager there who is Danny Gilish, who has since joined our club. And um, anyway, I wanted to get Hugo to come and talk about DACA. And then, Hugo, you got promoted out of the area. And I was disappointed that yeah. I didn't get you as a program before you were gone. But now with the advent yeah. of Zoom, nothing holds us back. And we are so excited to have Hugo here to talk about DACA and his experiences. So with that, I introduce Hugo. Hugo. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start, obviously, with my story. I know I sent out a um, slideshow. I don't know if that can come up. Um, or if anybody can see that, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, just I just wanted to have a visual for everybody so you can see it. Um, but a little bit about me. So I was born in Mexico, Veracruz, which is on the Gulf Coast. Um, so if you want to hit next slide on that one. You want, can, can you go to the next slide oh, or see if it does anything? Hey, I'm sorry, I'm having, a, I'm having a little bit of a problem here. Hang on, please. I can't even see what okay, slide no Just trying again. Let's see. Okay, now I got it. Okay. Now, it's one more second, okay? No worries. <laughs> there we go. Where are you located now, Hugo? So I am located in Tacoma, Washington. So I moved, I, I got married. Um, so my wife grew up in Shoreline, uh, which is near Seattle, and we wanted to be, be out here so she, we could be closer to or I could be closer to the in-laws because they're pretty cool. <laughs> so we moved out here closer to them. But but yeah, going back to my story. So um, kind of, so I grew up in Mexico, Veracruz. So if you look on the top right picture, the what's highlighted yellow, that's where I'm from, or that's the state that I'm from. And um, obviously my parents uh, decided, you know, one day my mom got a call from my dad and was like, we are moving to the United States. And I, at that time, I didn't know what it meant for me. Obviously, uh, on there, you can see a picture of all my cousins and grandparents, uh, which I was very close to them. And every Sunday, we will hang out with our grandparents, we will have dinner. Uh, my grandma will make uh, fried fish or shrimp or and and that was kind of our way of life. And we would play soccer. We would go around and eat tacos. So that was kind of that was kind of my lifestyle. And then obviously, when I moved to America, at that time, I didn't understand what that meant. So when when we came to the United States, um, we I crossed the border with my mom, and we walked the desert for about two days. From what I remember, when I was younger, because I was about 11 years old, and now I am 27. Um, I was, I was kind of, I was in worry and I never realized the, um, I never realized how dangerous it was until I got older and kind of started realizing like all the negative things, all the, all the bad things that could have happened to me and my mom while crossing the border. Um, we walked for about two days. Um, I was dehydrated. I, I remember towards the end of the, the second day, I remember I passed out and I woke up in a car and obviously, um, you know, I, that, that was such a big thing for me, but the whole time I try to kind of act like I was 
I was okay doing the whole thing because I could see in the eyes of my mom and the eyes of everybody in there that they were really concerned and worried. They all looked really scared. So I didn't want to add to the panic that when we were crossing the border. So after we crossed the border, we arrived to Salem, Oregon, where I grew up. And if you want to go to the next page, um, so I grew up in Salem, Oregon, and I remember that I had a big influence on in one of my history teachers um, in middle school. And from there, I was very passionate about, you know, the founding fathers um, and kind of learning about the history of the United States and the reason why this country had been built and kind of learning, you know, it was built by immigrants and it was built by people that had a dream to make things better. So my, my goal when I started high school was to eventually um, join the military, maybe the CIA, uh, to be able to defend this country and uphold the values of the American way of life uh, at that time. So one of the things that I did, I got really involved in my community. Um, I became a police cadet. I was a fire explorer. I played uh, football. I was uh, involved in our army, ROTC, and I was the company commander, and I was involved in my city council. And during that time, I remember that while I was doing those things, because I was volunteering definitely over 100 hours per month, uh, some days I would not even slip in, and sometimes too, with school going on, I, I went from, because I really wanted to push myself and, and be like, hey, if maybe if I show that I want to be part of this country, and maybe if I do the right things and kind of show that I have the American values, maybe they will make an exception for me um, to be able to kind of join the military. So I, so I was pushing myself, and I went from, I, I mean, in high school, uh, back in 2009, I went from English learning classes to honors classes. And for me, it was, the language was definitely a struggle at that time. Uh, most, of the, most of the time, I mean, I would go to sleep until 2 a.m. doing homework, just trying to translate things or trying to do an essay. And sometimes I would go to sleep crying because I couldn't understand the homework and I kind of felt useless and my parents couldn't help me. And obviously your teacher can't help you, can only do so much to help you out. Um, so after, when I graduated high school, I gave a speech to my graduating class and I was actually really, uh, I was surprised that I was, I was gonna be able to speak to about, I was in front of a, about 4,000 people. And the thought of it, like for me, it was inspirable that they got to pick me to talk uh, to my class. But then at the same time, I was kind of, um, I was kind of sad because I knew that was kind of the end for me. Cause we always joke in, joke in high school that, why do you go to school so you can end up working in the fields? And we always repeated that. And that was kind of what I thought at that time um, that that was going to happen to me. So when I, the day of, I was like, maybe I shouldn't show up to graduation. Maybe I shouldn't do this. And my parents were really encouraging me to just show up to the, to the graduation. Um, and, and I did in the end. Um, but after that, my graduation speech, basically what I told my, what I told my classmates was that, you know, anything is possible because if you had, if you put the effort, if you work hard, like I did, where I didn't know a lot of English and I was really involved in the community, then you can make uh, your American dream come true. And for me, it kind of felt like a lie. And at that time, I, I still hadn't disclosed that I was undocumented to anybody. And um, so nobody knew um, that I was undocumented through high school. And what was really interesting is that I, I was just always afraid of kind of telling or sharing it with anybody because I never knew what will be the response with, 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 with everyone else. Um, so, so when I left high school, I mean, I felt ashamed. I went into a depression and it, and it was really bad for me because I didn't know what was going to happen to me when you're like, hey, everybody, like the congressman is writing you to be like, hey, do you need a letter to go to West Point where everybody in the community is like, hey, are you looking to go to Harvard, Yale, and all these different things? And then you can't really tell them that you're undocumented because even if you disclose that, you can put your parents in danger or you, can, or you know that they might not be able to do much to help you out at the end of the day. Um, so 
when I left high school, I started working in a grass seed mill down in Salem, Oregon. And for me, that, that was really eye-opening to really understand what is happening in the undocumented community. And what was sad was that at that time, I was also very involved in the business community in Salem, Oregon. So I knew a lot of the business owners um, and to be able to see those same business owners abusing uh, undocumented families and abusing worker rights was just shocking to me. I mean, when I was working in that grassy meal, they would not pay us overtime. They would cut our hours. They would always, every time somebody got hurt, they would just fire them on the spot. And, and to me, that was depressing. I mean, watching a guy getting his finger cut off and then the next day they just fire him like nothing, that was sad to me. And, and then watching people like break their bags and then having to work the next day as well because they know that they, they miss one day they will get fired. That was, that was not the America that I learned to love when I was doing all those different things in the community. And I was like, wow, this is really, this is something that nobody has seen or nobody's aware of all those things. So it, it was very, it was very eye-opening to me. And I saw Oregon to be a volunteer with them. And I said, I had enough of this and I need to make it public that I am undocumented and that we need to change things because that is not the America that we know. And that is not right just for anybody to go through or put through because what I thought about was like, well, you know, it was really hard for me, but imagine all the other people that have the same kind of aspirations and have done so much through high school, or maybe they just want to be a dad, but, but they can't do those things because they were not born as an American citizen or they don't have a social security. Uh, so after, after I left my job, um, I, I started working uh, with CAUSA, and that started back to 2011, 2012. And with them, I, I was able to, um, to be involved with driver's license. I was, able, I was able to be involved with tuition equity and be able to kind of push for that, share my story at the state level. I knocked a lot of doors, I went to Portland, went to Eugene, went to Salem, went to Eastern Oregon, and really give the idea of who are, you know, who are the dreamers. And that's how, well, that's what they call us because of the DREAM Act. And basically are, if you're, basically are young people who came here so undocumented, either because their parents brought them here or they came by themselves, and they just don't have a, basically a green card or a paper that says that you're allowed to be here in the United States and it's preventing them from uh, doing anything in the communities or being involved in the communities. Um, so during that time, uh, the President Obama um, decided to move forward with what we call Defer Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, and I believe this was back in 2011, 2012. So I decided to apply for that. and. And I remember when I applied for that, obviously I was really scared because I had to disclose a lot of different things of me being here undocumented in, in the country. And then I also had to disclose a lot of information of my parents. And I mean, I was afraid that they would show up someday and, and kind of just come and take us all. But, um, but thankfully I got my DACA. When I received that permit, I mean, I, I literally cried because I was like, I've done so much for, for my community to literally have to still try to justify myself, uh, to just get this one ID card that can be printed somewhere and somebody tells me now you're allowed, well, and you're allowed to be here if we decide to keep you here. Um, and I, I was able to get my driver's license. That was such a big deal for me. I mean, it was also hard for me to be able to drive because I knew that my parents don't drive with the license. I knew that there's other community or other people like me that just going to church, just going to get their groceries was such a risk for them. And for me, it was kind of like a normal thing. And being able to also explore Oregon, I mean, when I was in Salem, Oregon, that was, that was where I was because I couldn't drive. And once I got my driver's license, I got to explore a lot of beautiful places that are, that are out there in, in Oregon. And, and I was really lucky to be able to see that because obviously my parents are not gonna take the risk to drive out 
you know, to go for a hike or, or get to see Crater Lake or do other things because obviously that's a big concern for them. So after I was involved with DACA, um, I, I went to University of Oregon and I was there for about four years and I still haven't graduated. I'm planning to go back uh, to school and finish my undergrad degree now that I'm able to have a little more money to be able to pay for tuition. Uh, because even though with my DACA, basically my DACA, all, all my deferred action, what it does, it allows me to work legally in the United States. It does not allow me, it does not grant me any financial aid, any federal help, because I'm not allowed to do that. And, and that's basically it. So even though I was able to go to college, we still did not get uh, financial aid at that time when I first went, because I, I remember I was one of the first 13 students that attended University of Oregon. As a, as a DACA member and, and the University of Oregon at that time didn't really know, you know, what are the services or things that we need to help out these students make sure that they graduate uh, and be able to have enough financial help to finish school. So while well, attending the University of Oregon, I, I, I was able to travel back to Mexico uh, back in 2015, 2016 and President Obama and the Mexican president at that time uh, selected 30 students with, with, who were DACA recipients to be able to go outside the United States, go to Mexico for one week and be able to come back legally to the United States. Uh, so during that time, um, I was able to learn the reason why my parents brought me to this country. I was able to see, you know, what was the reality of Mexico and obviously seeing it in a different perspective of like, somebody who was able to get educated, understand about how things were and how the world works. And, and to me, it was like, wow, my town was empty. And it was literally going bankrupt because, um, obviously because of the free trade and how competitive things are nowadays with the sugarcane production, there's literally no jobs. When I went there, people were just kind of walking down the place and there was nobody there in my town. My house was just kind of falling apart. And, and it was kind of sad to see that where, where I grew up, but also it was kind of, it was a sad reality of like where I was and how I, would, I was not gonna have a future. And I was always gonna stay in that town and to realize that I did have the potential to accomplish a lot of things. I mean, to me, that was, that was also kind of, that was, I was thankful that my parents brought me to this country and I learned about the reason why. And, I mean, all the crime too. I mean, when I was down there, be because I was invited by the Mexican president, I had bodyguards all, all, all I went, wherever I went. Um, so I felt safe. And obviously that is not the case for most of, most of Mexicans that live in, in those areas, specifically from where I am from, where um, it's very, it, there's a lot of crime kind of rising because of the cartels and just where, where the state is located in Mexico. Um, so after, after that, I mean, I was lucky to, to be involved, like I said, with tuition equity, driver's license, uh, DACA, and currently with the current administration, um, we were doing a lot of efforts, obviously, to make sure that DACA did not get removed. And the last, I would say, 2016 and 17, um, they were really hard for me because we were organizing, we were in DC, uh, we were sleeping in churches, we were going to churches that would literally get burned down by people that would not, that would literally see us as enemies. And we were organizing and we were getting, we were going into like a lot of the senators and congressmen offices, we were all sitting in there and we would just do a lot of civil disobedience until somebody came up and talked to us because obviously DACA was so important, not just for us, but also for our parents, because at that time we were pushing for immigration reform and obviously we're still pushing for it. Um, but the current administration really did a, created a war against us. And, and obviously, as, as you see recently with, with the court, he was actively trying to remove DACA. And luckily the court decided that they did not have enough to be able to shut down uh, the deferred action for childhood arrivals. Um, so, I think for for you know what's happening currently with DACA, right, and and with all the things is, I mean, thankfully now the Supreme Court has decided to keep DACA, and 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 that's a really good thing because obviously my 
my permit was about to expire. Um, so I was able to renew and get it done with, but you know, when you think about like, Hey, I am, you know, I'm a branch manager and I am kind of managing about a hundred million dollars and be able to tell my, my employees and my employer to be like, Hey, I might not be able to come back tomorrow because the court may decide that that's just something that kind of keeps you awake at night. And it's also something that you're always concerned because you know that your family, like my parents are at risk and, and currently, you know, we have DACA, uh, but that's not enough. I think for people that have DACA, we are kind of tired of always waiting for one el for an election, always waiting for a reform, always waiting for another president or Supreme Court order. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of building up, and now it's time for people, especially our allies, to be proactive and make sure that they find ways to either push their congress their congressmen or also find ways to help them out. When I think about you know what's next and in the future, you know, I was thinking about my brother and sister that are, you know, very important to me. So I think about my brother because currently he has DACA and has two kids. Can you imagine if DACA got removed or can you imagine if um, for some reason they, they never moved with the path to citizenship? Eventually he will turn 31 and will not be able to qualify for DACA. Or my sister that's currently dating somebody else that also has DACA as well. And, you know, what will happen to them? Will they not be able to live a normal life? And there's obviously other people as well who also do not qualify for deferred action for childhood arrivals uh, who have the same story as me, but because they just did not meet the qualifications, they, they, they don't have that. Um, so I think for, for my story, like I said, I, my story is pretty unique compared to other DACA members, but we always have to keep in mind there's other ones that are struggling a lot more than I am. Uh, there's other ones that, you know, with COVID happening right now, who cannot work, like my brother too, as well, was furloughed and now has to find a job, right? And we don't get to have, have those uh, fancy checks that Trump sends, and we don't have, we don't, we don't get any unemployment. We don't get to qualify for those things. That's just not an option for us. So with that being said, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> so I can... Uh, I can answer any questions that you may have about the for action or my story that maybe uh, you want me to clarify or maybe you're interested in knowing more about. I'm curious, um, Hugo, about how, how your family ended up in Salem. How did they end up coming all the way up to Salem? Yeah, so the, so the reason why is because a lot of the, um, it has to do with a lot of the, the field with agriculture work that, that's okay. available yeah. in Oregon. Yeah. And yeah. actually we have um, a lot of the things with, with undocumented people that they're mixed status. So actually my uncle is a citizen. So he was originally here in Salem. So that was the reason why my dad came out to Salem um, here. And, and obviously we have other uncles who are citizens as well, mm -hmm. but my dad, my dad is not. So that's kind of, that's kind of how we ended up in Salem. So, that's how it kind of works on that. <laughs> that that's how that usually works. <laughs> it's a great story. Congratulations to you for all the persistence. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one, Hugo. I want to first congratulate you. You have been an outstanding student, an outstanding leader. Uh, you have done an incredible amount of work to achieve all that you have. It's, it's very, very impressive. Um, we're looking at, I think, one of those really outstanding students that uh, we are so lucky to have in our country right now. And uh, we want you to have permanent residency. I'm wondering of all the things that you have learned about the difficulty for other people who are undocumented here, what would be your three most the highest priorities of things that we should be changing in terms of our government and our our laws, uh, regulations, and so on. Particularly, I'm worried about migrant workers. You know, people who work in the fields. But what are your, from your experiences, the three most important things that you think you might work on, if and recommend to others to work on in terms of getting more social yeah. justice. I think that there's actually, uh, yeah, so I think the first thing would number one and always be uh, 
you know, healthcare. So like health related things that can be available for people that are undocumented. Um, so that, that will be one of them. The other one is um, it, like education accessibility, making sure that people have access to financial aid for, for a lot of people that have DACA like myself. So I was actually, um, you know, interested enough. I was helped by a, by a Supreme Court Chief Justice that helped me kind of pay for my tuition. So that's why I was able to attend three years at University of Oregon. Uh, but obviously most DACA members do not have that type of financial help. So, that, so that's definitely important. And the last one is uh, being able to kind of, I guess, integrate the undocumented community into other venues because, I mean, I was very involved with the police department, the fire, de fire department. So I was very comfortable to approach them, to have conversations with them. Uh, and obviously that's not the case in the Latino community. Uh, and then there's always that language barrier. So, so those will be the, the three things, I guess, that I would say. That's great. Yeah, excellent points. I wondered if NAFTA would come up, but not yet. <laughs> yeah. That too, but yeah, that you saw. Yeah. yeah, many good priorities. Thank you. And Hugo, good luck. Yeah. are you still interested yeah. in law enforcement or the military? Uh, I still am. Um, obviously, um, I think that was my biggest aspiration and it has always been. And I think for me, honestly, it was the hardest thing for me once I, I was getting older to realize that was not going to be a thing for me. Not necessarily. Um, I would encourage you to continue to apply in the sense that the uh, current law allows for someone to be a sworn law enforcement officer for at least a year to a year and a half before they receive their citizenship. And yeah. uh, military has a pathway to citizenship. Uh, for uh, undocumented folks, at least they have it for foreign nationals, um, uh, where yeah. where you can serve four years and then and then you know become a citizen that way. So that might well, be a, and, might be an option. Yeah. So I I've yeah I've talked about it. So I, I something I forgot to mention. So I, I recently got married. Uh, my wife obviously is a U.S. citizen. Uh, but uh, as I move forward with my green card, that will more likely be something that, that I'm going to be looking down down the road to see, see if it's an opportunity. But yeah, my cool. something I, I wanted to add in there, you know, my 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 wife, so she's from the Netherlands, so her whole family actually immigrated to the United States because they were escaping the Holocaust. So they have a lot of stories that I remember about the Nazis, and they're super supportive. Uh, so that has been uh, has been really unique and helpful um, mm -hmm. to kind of help me out th through my process here. Um, I just wanted to mention, I guess identify myself, I'm in the Department of International Studies, and I know my department has played a major role in supporting DACA, Dreamer students, and the like, and I hope that um, in some way we've been able to be of help to you. We are now mobilizing yeah. on campus about this new ICE edict about um, not allowing international students to remain on campus, on campuses anywhere in the US, if they're only taking remote classes. Um, and I'm very proud that the University of Oregon has taken a very active role in supporting getting rid of that new yeah. edict. <laughs> um, yeah. You probably have heard that Harvard and MIT have already lodged a lawsuit. The Association of American Universities that we're a part of um, has also yeah. lodged a lot of um, a lot of protests. I've been signing national protest letters and all. But I <laughs> hope that this does not in any way negatively impact DACA Dreamer students who also may have to take remote um, online courses. I don't know, I, I haven't read anything specific for that group. And I hope that that's not true. Yeah. So I, I don't, I haven't seen anything for that specifically, but one of the things um, about DACA is that you have to be in school or have a high school degree in order to qualify into DACA. So people are able, so now that the, the, basically the Supreme Court has upheld kind of DACA or be able to keep it now, I believe that they're going to start taking the application. So like my sister, because she was too young, she didn't have DACA. So if, for example, for some reason, people can't graduate or can't take online classes, then that may become an obstacle for people that are in high school. Uh, but, but, but I haven't seen anything about that as of right now.